A World of Prose, 3rd edition, edited by Hazel Simmons MacDonald and Mark McWatt. Hodder Education. Blood Brothers by John Wickham. The sun was boiling hot and the house was stifling him. So Paul took his pencils and his watercolors and went to sit under the casuarina trees. The air was still and it shimmered in the noonday heat and Paul felt sleepy. But he fought against the sleep and, gripping the pencil in his fingers, set about the sketch he was about to make. The picture he wanted to paint he could see in his mind more clearly than with his eyes. For all of his thirteen years he had seen the things he was seeing now and they were etched in his memory an indestructible part of him, indivisible from himself and his own thoughts, a part of him that not even his twin brother Benji and his insufferable complex of superiority could destroy. The long grass bent in the wind, the hibiscus flowers shone violent red in the sunlight, and the casuarinas swayed and spoke in sibilant whispers. It was cool under the casuarinas, and Paul stuck the pencil in his mouth and, lying flat on his back, looked up through the gossamer lacework of the tree's foliage to the sky. Funny, thought Paul that in the daylight casuarina trees could be so tall and graceful and slender and lovely, swaying in the wind and bending, whispering ever so languidly like lovely ladies in pictures. And yet at night, by starlight and moonlight, they assumed such fantastic, frightening ghost-like shapes. Casuarinas at night! Paul shuddered at the memory. He and Benji had set out for a walk with their father after dinner one night. Paul remembered even now, after six or seven years, that the moon was rising when they left home and Benji had been in even gayer spirits than usual. He had just discovered that he could whistle. Paul remembered too that Benji's laugh had mocked him because he had not yet learned to whistle and he had been silent at this added proof of his brother's superiority. He hated Benji for this small triumph and for his sneering, contemptuous way of being able to do everything better than he, for treating him with his air of studied disdain, as if he were a little girl who had to be helped over fences, who wasn't expected to climb trees and bring down birds with catapults, and who would burst into tears for nothing that he, Benji, could understand. Paul remembered that, when they had turned into Garnet Road, the Casuarina shadows were lying across the road in fantastic shapes, delicate shadow, diffused in the soft light, weird and macabre and the wind was whispering thinly through the trees with the unearthly voice of a ghost. The whole picture was faintly lit by the spectral light of the moon slanting through the trees, and he had been afraid. He had clutched his father's hand, and his father had, it seemed, understood that he was afraid and had squeezed his hand in reassurance. Only Benji, unaware and unafraid, hopped and danced along the road, exploiting his newly discovered whistle and flaunting his own complete lack of fear, his own blatant intrepidity in the face of the wraith-like shadows and the ghostly voices of the trees. As Paul pieced together the memory of long ago, his heart filled with a full-blooded hate for his blood brother. Paul looked up through the trees of the sky and knew that in Benji's eyes he was a coward. It was no solace to his wounded spirit to know that Benji had never called him coward. His brother's own lack of fear, his recklessness and his arrant devil-may-care swagger was to him an unspoken insinuation of his own cowardice and he felt the stigma of his own timidity each time Benji and he played together, his self-contempt and distaste for his own chicken-heartedness implicit in his slavish, albeit unwilling, hero-worship of his twin brother. Paul hated Benji with a bitter, passionate venom, 
and with all his heart's fierceness, he hated and despised himself for hating him. In quiet moments, as now, alone with himself staring up at the blue pool of the sky, or sketching on the hill with the wind in his ears, it was easy for him to love his brother as himself. When he rose early in the morning and walked through the dew-wet grass to his spot on the hill, he wished that Benji could be with him. He would like to talk to him, to tell him that he really wasn't a coward, that there were all sorts of queer little goings-on inside him, that he knew the way of the blue mist on the green hills, the way of the white pigeons flying in joyous circles around the house. He yearned with every fibre of him, with a fervour not damped by these many years of vain wishing to share with Benji the secret ways of his heart. He wanted to link arms with Benji, to tap from his limitless reservoir of courage some measure of it for himself, so that the two of them could walk together as one. He yearned for this so deeply that he was afraid, afraid that Benji, the little man, so universally applauded for his daring, so consistent in his acts of heroism, climbing to the top of the tamarind tree, careless whether he fell, daring to crawl under the house to search for the hen's eggs in the darkness, breaking his arm and betraying not so much as a wince when the doctor at the hospital set it, afraid that Benji would reject his offer and interpret his overture as another proof of his cowardice. Paul hugged his secrets close and retired into himself his thought buried so deep inside him that they turned sour and the germ of his potential love turned to bitter hate. Sometimes the violence of his hate frightened Paul and he trembled, unable to contain within his frail body the seething tumult of his inner conflict, the love he bore his brother, the admiration he had for his popularity, and the twinkling smile in his eye contending in his heart with his own envy, the timid sense of his own timid spirit and his own tongue-tied shyness, and out of the turmoil inside him there sprouted his own violent hate, deep and morbid because it was rooted and nurtured in the fertile compost heap of his own unavowed love. And always, Paul hated Benji's presence for reminding him of the night of the ghostly shadows and the thin whisper of the casuarinas. Benji sauntered through the back gate, his teeth biting deep into a piece of bread. Paul guessed that he had rifled the larder, for Benji, it seemed to him, would do that and glory in the doing. Benji swaggered past Paul, lying on his back under the trees in an exaggerated goose step of triumph, secure and unassailable in the citadel of his own good humour and blithe spirit, never dreaming that there could be anyone in the whole wide world who did not wish him well, and caring less than a row of pins for anyone who wished him evil. Paul's hate grew big. Look at him, he said to himself. Strutting like a cock. He knows I'm watching him. He's only pretending that he doesn't care. Benji sat under the tamarind tree and finished his bread. When he had finished, he got up and began throwing stones idly across the pasture. He grew tired of this after a short while and Paul's eyes were on him when he tossed his head in defiance of the boredom that he was setting in. He called out to Paul. See who can throw farthest! he shouted. No, Paul answered back. His voice was abrupt and held no hint of longing in his heart to share games with Benji. And besides, he went on in an effort to prove himself superior, it's father. The hint was to Benji like water off a duck's back. He ignored it and started to climb the tamarind tree. Let's play Tarzan. He invited, letting out the ape man's blood curdling yell. Paul did not bother to answer. He sat brooding on his brother, and his hate flooded through his body and the blood pounded in his ears. Let's go over to Mac, he suggested. 
undeterred and with his sunniest smile in spite of Paul's refusers. And Paul, because in the end Benji always made him do what he wanted, subjected his will and walked along with Benji. Mac was the old shoemaker in the village and his shop was the meeting place of the boys during the holidays. Today, the shop was empty, except for Mac who was sitting on his little bench at the door stitching a shoe. The twins strolled into the tumble-down shop. Hello, Mac, said Benji and went through the back door to the gova tree in the yard. Hello, Mac, said Paul and took a seat on the floor behind the shoemaker's back. Hello, boys said Mac, and went on with his stitching. Paul picked up one of Mac's awls and began making holes in an old piece of leather he found on the floor. Benji, out in the yard, was tearing off the bark of the gova tree with his teeth and pretending he was a wild animal. A few minutes passed. Then Benji shouted, Come and play, Paul! But Paul did not answer. He only sat idly punching holes in the piece of leather with the sharp awl. Benji strolled back into the shop. Paul felt him enter, but he didn't look up. He just went on pushing the awl through the leather and pulling it out again. Benji walked across to him and touched him on the shoulder. Oh, come and play, he pleaded. At the touch of his brother's hand, Paul's blood surged within him, and all the pent-up hate and fear and envy, all the accumulated jealousy and worship of the years flooded through him. His blood was hot inside him, and he was blind with anger. He dropped the piece of leather from his hand, and with one violent push, hurled Benji into the corner. He ran across the room and stood over him, the all poised in his right hand for a swift, murderous blow. Then he saw the look of incomprehension on his brother's face. The look of why? What have I done? The look of puzzlement and surprise. And he saw the wide-eyed look of horror and fear in Benji's eyes. The all dropped from Paul's hand and he turned away. Mac had not even looked up. So sure was he that the boys were playing, so swiftly had the action moved. Paul passed Mac at his little bench and walked silently home, trembling and confused and frightened by the violence of his action. But purged of hate and happy at the discovery that his brother also knew fear.